Yeah, lovely scenario this morning in the city of Abuja, where the weather at the moment is about 25 degrees centigrade. But humidity, ooh, 65 percent. Who would have thought so? Getting hotter, I tell you. All the same, a very good morning to you all. Welcome to Sunrise Daily this lovely Tuesday morning. I'm trembling, you so. It is indeed cool and calm here in the Federal Capital Territory and the visuals greeting you right there on your screen. <coughs> Unity Fountain uh, right here in the Federal Capital Territory and that place has now become quite prominent for hosting protests. Right now it's all calm but who knows for how much longer it's going to be devoid of people who want to get their voices heard on one thing or the other. Good morning and welcome. And here in Lagos, it is no less cool, calm, and collected as at this moment that the, what we are enjoying is just that cool, calm, and collected. And I'm hoping, just as you said, Malfoy, that at least at some point, you know, we will all understand exactly what is going on. This is Lagos. This is Yaba in Lagos. Uh, at the, and um, what you're seeing there is quite the sight, isn't it? Uh, the weather is something in the region of uh, 28 degrees this morning. And uh, of course, you can see that um, sea bridge right there in Yaba, you know, hovering around the bus stations and um, the rail lines as well. But that's not the only thing that has happened in Lagos today. In some parts of the city, it has also rained heavily. So this extent that, I mean, this is what you have in some parts of the city of Lagos here. Yeah, this is Ogba in Lagos. And um, of course you can see how, how heavy it has been. Some parts of Lagos, you mark where I'm chairman, you would know that sometimes it would rain in some areas, it would not rain in some areas. And when it does rain heavily in some areas, this is the kind of effect you get. But this is what is happening at Ogba. Now I'm aware that there is some road work going on further down this road at Ogba bus stop in particular because of the state of the road that has become bad, which is also likely to inform some traffic. All the same, this is Lagos. Welcome to Sunrise Daily. I'm Ayo Makile. Well, we could, we could do with some rain, Chamberlain. You don't think so? Yeah, I know. But this image you see here, this amateur video, happened in Abuja yesterday, we say zone four area specifically. Now, those you see in red, clad in red, are officials of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, the EFCC. They raised a special task force across their command, and the purpose was to clamp down on individuals mutilating the Naira and dollarizing the Nigerian economy. Now, the commission said they raided the BDC arrested about 50 people because they say they were illegal traders. Now, this cost of living seems to be getting to a lot of people in different ways and manifested in different ways too, I tell you. Because this scenario, of course, you had those BDC operators fight back, saying no such thing happening here. Some of the BDC operators were of the impression that the commission is accusing them of being the ones manipulating the value of the Naira such that the Naira is tanking against the dollar. Uh, so they thought that that was why they were there. But the commission did say that, um, well, there were illegal operators responsible for, well, at least some untoward actions there. So they had to go in there and move in. I know there are several questions as to, well, how did they arrive and know that uh, they were illegal operators? But, but that is why you see that commotion right there. What about the last of it? I can't tell you that. I, 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 I kid you not. I can't give you that information. But at the moment, associated with the cost of living, the value of the Naira against the dollar, there's still a conversation going on, I tell you. Well, this is certainly not the first time that we've seen EFCC officials uh, raid. Uh, this will be most likely in Wuse Zone 4, mm -hmm. uh, which is like the headquarters of where you have the BDCs yeah. um, here in the Federal Capital Territory. It's, this is not the first time, it's not the second time, so you're right on that one, Chamberlain. It certainly will not be the last time. I mean, I, I hate to say it like that, but that's what it is. It is what it is. Um, now, exactly, I'm asking the same questions as you. I mean, how did the EFCC come to the conclusion that these people could be responsible for the high cost of living? 
if there's anything we know, we know that um, scarcity is what, how, how do I put it now? Yeah, uh, prices respond to scarcity. Mm -hmm. When things are scarce, we know in simple economics, the prices go up. When they are available in abundance, the prices come down. So if we're now in a situation whereby we do not have dollars, where almost even our Naira is tanking, people have a little savings. I mean, I was listening to Jude's analysis on the news at 10 on Sunday, and he was talking about how if you keep your money in the bank, it's depreciated. You buy government bonds, it's depreciated. You know, almost everything you, in fact, if you use the word, you lose. <laughs> keep your money in the bank. Even you when lose. you don't snooze. <laughs> yes, you lose. You buy government bonds, you lose. Oh dear. You buy treasury bills, you lose. What do you then do with your money? You look at it every day and it's losing value. So you find a number of people are saying, you know what, I might as well buy the dollar. And so there is a hot scramble. And this has been on now for a number of months. It's been on for a, a long time, actually. It's been on for years, as a matter of fact. And well. we've been looking at the steady depreciation. So this, I don't know, I think it's just chasing symptoms. We're not addressing the root causes. Can we address the root causes and come back to us? Well, I, I'm not able to you know, speak directly to what it is that the EFCC is trying to achieve by this. I mean, of course, by all means, government should apply sanity where there is insanity. However, if we see that we actually have ringworm and we have leprosy, I think Yoruba <laughs> Adi says... illegal should... operators. Uh, exactly. So if they are illegal operators, as the commission says, you cannot operate illegally. Isn't that because you're seeing them outside? What about the illegal operators that are operating from their bedrooms? What about those ones? Well, maybe the commission is going after them too. We don't okay. know. So you, you never can tell. I'm not justifying anyone. I mean, if, by all means, if you want to clamp down on it. When, ever since I was young, Chamberlain, when I used to hear the word black market, I used to assume that it happened in the dark. I didn't know that black markets actually happened in broad daylight. It was a real shocker to me to see that black market is... When I was going to school, this was in 2009 or 2008, a lot of the pounds sterling I had to take in my hands were bought on the black market in broad daylight. This has been on for as long as I can remember. So please, I mean, I don't know really. I, I think that the EFCC can explain to us what the rationale is or what exactly they're trying to do. But if you ask a lot of people, they will tell you this is symptoms you're chasing. Maybe you're trying to cure a headache. There is cancer that's causing this headache, and I think we need to deal with it. Ayo. Let, let me just, uh, you know, remind you guys that just as you said, uh, uh, Malfoy, in July 2022, this same issue was reported in the media. Guess where the EFCC uh, was said to have uh, arrested, uh, to have uh, raided? We'll say Zone 4 area of Abuja. November 1, 2022, it was also reported that the AFC, EFCC conducted a raid. Guess where? We say Zone 4, Abuja. And now this one that we are talking about. Guess where the EFCC also raided? We say Zone 4, Abuja. Is that the headquarters of the black, of uh, the BDCs? Is that the headquarters? Is that the biggest? Is that the best? Is that the only one? I thought there were black markets all over Nigeria. If the currency speculators uh, are, so to speak, uh, domiciled in this particular place, how about we move to somewhere, somewhere else? Has there been any such conduct? And these two, the first two that I just mentioned in July and November, they happened in 2022. I'm not sure if there was any such in 2023. Perhaps because it's election year, I don't know. And now this is happening, and guess when? In the February of 2024. So exactly what is happening? Yes, Neota, uh, beg your pardon, Mark Bay and Chamberlain, I agree with you. We need a little further explanation from the EFCC about exactly what is going on. It's the symptoms is not going to help us deal with the disease. Back to you guys. Well, taking a look at what is happening today and uh, what do you see there? Cost of leaving is right there. Um, and the Public Complaints Commission is going to be having a press conference much later today. Don't forget the last week they had threatened to go on strike and they had also protested um, over their own wages. So if the Public Complaints Commission is complaining 
that there's fire on the mountain, Chamberlain. As a matter of fact, there's been a fire on the mountain since forever. I remember that Asha came to the launch of NNPC Limited and sang fire on the mountain there. And I, and I was surprised that nobody saw when she said the fire. Did she, did she, so, what, 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 I guess she was what, 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 just oh, singing boy. what she already saw. You know? So I was saying, talking to someone yesterday and I said, Lord, this fire is getting bigger. We need fire extinguishers. But if one of the country's major fire extinguishers, the Public Complaints Commission, is complaining, well, we had better be listening. So we'll be looking out for that press conference today um, and let you know just what exactly it is they're saying. Are they complaining on behalf of Nigerians or is this their own complaint which has not been listened to or heard? We'll be waiting to see. Yeah, so while that that in the House of Representatives, do you remember that conversation about what well, everybody calls, and a lot of people call state police. Well, it comes up again on the floor of the House of Representatives today, Tuesday. And they, that bill to alter the Constitution to allow for, there you go, state police. So the bill, again, to alter the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999 to provide for establishment of state police and other related matters will be coming up today. So, um, of course, you have lots of people who are already looking ahead of us. They see, seem to see the end of this from the beginning. They think it will fall through. Who knows? Even that of the moving or switching from presidential system to parliamentary system, they think it will equally fall through because, I mean, this one had done so before when it came up before and it didn't scale. So, who knows? But this is what is going to happen today. That's all we can tell you at the moment. Well, the conversation definitely continues. But uh, in the meantime, at the top of the next hour, which is 10 o'clock, business news on Sunrise Daily. Business morning on Sunrise Daily will come to you. And guess what it's all about? Still on the surging prices of commodities all over the nation. And well, <laughs> when you talk business, commodities could have different meanings. You better stay up until 10 o'clock when that uh, conversation will come to us. Let's switch to the papers now. All right, let's take you through some of the dailies. We start with Daily Trust this morning. Food prices drop. Yeah, that's the key word. Drop in Kano, Taraba, Kwara, Niger. What's going on? Who has a magic wand? Well, look at the riders. Governments go after hoarders. Oh. Feed companies suspend mop up. Hunger protest spreads to Ibadan. So, I know you think what? Could it be because they went after the hoarders that came about? This one? We don't know, but this is the lead story on the front page here today. A very worrisome headline on the front page of New Telegraph. And guess where they got it from? From Channel Television's politics today. That's why we tell you to keep locked on here on Channel Television. Look at the lead headline there. No 42,000 metric tons of grains in federal government strategic reserves silos. That's according to Bugaje. Says government rented out all its silos. Can't control prices of produce. It doesn't have a very strong statement right there um, made by former House of Reps member, um, Honorable Bugaje. You also see right there other stories. Nigerians grappling with problems Buhari planted. That's according to Middle Belt Forum. Stop the blame games. AFTA tells federal government Governors, the battle youth protest call for good governance. And that's what you find on the front page of the Telegraph. Well, and that's exactly what the this Nigeria newspaper leads with this morning. Uh, high cost of living protest, Ibadan joins protest train. That's what you have right there. Uh, the stories are on pages two and nineteen. Look at the writers. Tinubu knows Nigerians are suffering, says APC chieftain. Market defies CBN's reforms as Naira trades at 1,655 to the dollar. Well, that's another symptom. What is the cause? That's uh, the lead story of this Nigeria today. 
forex crisis trigger major dislocations in 2024 budget and then above that you get to see fg cement manufacturers agree on 7000 slash 8000 naira for 50 kg bag you heard that's vanguard i'm looking at the guardian now and they have this at the front page road infrastructure development federal government grants four trillion naira tax credit in five years as inflation threatens skim uh, that is also on the front page of the guardian this morning of course you see that tractor there and they tell you how much we need nigeria needs 438 trillion naira investment in infrastructure over the next 10 years let's leave it there for the guardian newspapers before I go to the Nigerian Observer, there's this interesting one on the front page of Blueprints talking about, uh, about the same thing as you have right there on the front page of that previous paper. Senate furious over 17 trillion naira loss to tax waivers. Questions, 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 right? Well, look at the writers. FRS insists on stopping 2.7 trillion naira fresh tax credits. Uh, and then the second one targets 19 trillion naira revenue in 2024. Wait a minute, how, how much is our budget this year again? I mean, just think, imagine you have 17 trillion naira of those tax waivers in that budget. I don't know, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. That's the lead story of uh, the Blueprint newspaper today. Hardship, no end in sight as protests continues. That's the big lead on the front page of leadership this morning. I'm taking a look at Nigerian News Direct, and you can test the veracity of my Yoruba by how I speak this one. It says, um, looking at it now, okay, is he hiding? Ebing Pawa, Nigerians chant in Ibadan protest. That's the lead story. Ebing Pawa, just in case you don't know what that means, it means we are hungry. That's what it means in Yoruba. Uh, decry hunger, insecurity, as PDP accused Tinubu APC of being overwhelmed, lacking capacity to govern, as a lead story on the front page of Nigerian News Direct. On the front page of uh, uh, the New Telegraph as well, okay, I think we took, took the uh, New Telegraph. Look at Daily Times newspaper today. APC knocks PDP governors of our call for Tinubu's resignation. Can we just end this politicking and face governance? But that's the lead story of uh, the Daily Times newspaper, and that picture also speaks a thousand words, as Malcolm would often remind us. Open borders and hardship. That's the big the banner right there. That's the Daily Pretty Times clear. newspaper's lead story. And uh, quick well, just look. looking at things that really stick out this morning, of mm -hmm. course, you can see the cost of living crisis is all over the dailies. It's been on the dailies now consistently yeah. for at least maybe the last one month or so. We've been saying this almost on a daily basis. And we've been saying that the federal government has had some responses. Uh, just last, was it two weeks ago, the federal government ordered the release of 42,000 metric tons of grains from its silos and then said it was also going to be speaking with rice millers mm -hmm. and that they had agreed to release 60,000 metric tons. So when you look at the front page of New Telegraph, um, 42,000 metric tons of grains in federal government strategic reserve silos or no 42,000 metric tons. As a matter of fact, the allegation is that all of the silos have been rented out and that the produce in the silos do not belong to the federal government. These are grievous allegations. These are grievous, this is something, not just grievous, it's egregious as a matter of fact. So we, <laughs> by today, I mean, after that sort of broadcast yeah. yesterday, that sort of response, <clears throat> by today, we should be seeing the Minister of Agriculture coming out to either debunk this or show evidence indeed that the federal government is in control and still has grains and silos which it is distributing. We yeah. understand that the, the president met with governors and it was on this same matter. Were they bluffing 
Were they just, you know, trying to pull the wool over the eyes of Nigerians? If indeed there are actually grains in, in these silos mm -hmm. and that the federal government has this, what is the method for distribution? So we need more clarity on this particular matter. This is not the kind of headline that should be glossed over. That over. kind of question also came up at the briefing. And what the minister said to the people when they asked that question was that, I think they were really going to wait for NEMA and one other agency in terms of the distribution. So, of course, there are more questions about the modalities, the criteria. All of those things need answers. Um, the if question I, now is, it doesn't even exist. Because the well, allegation is that there yeah. is no 42,000 so, metric tons. That's why I was going to say, government agencies need to then change the way they respond to things henceforth. You cannot be respond the way you were responding yesterday. Because even the deaf and the blind can see that they need your response. So, much as the president has given certain directives, they have meetings, we need to ask the question of the governors themselves. Those two trillion that was given to them for what palliatives, what happened to it? Because they poo pooed the initial uh, what, the list or the data, whatever it was. They said it wasn't good enough. They were going to come up with theirs. Do they have it? They need to publish it. People, the same people are protesting, say they're hungry. So who did the palliatives go to at the time? So lots of questions too for all of them out there. Well, I agree with you, I Chamberlain, am. on that. Yes, thank you. I, I agree with you on that, Chamberlain. And Marco, thank you for bringing that up. You know, um, let's just hope. Governors, let the governors speak. I love what, what's on the front page of Daily Trust, but that's not what I'm, where I'm going. While on the one hand, some states, gov, some, some states are saying that price, food prices are dropping in Oyo State, same country, uh, protests are, are continuing. And guess what? There's another protest looming on the front page of the Nigerian Observer this morning. Why, what's it about? Hardship in the country. And look at the lead story. Labor in show of coordination last, lapse. That's what the Nigerian, how the Nigerian Observer puts it. A splinter group threatens overlapping strike. Somehow, somehow, Chamberlain and Malkwe, I was thinking about this whole protest thing this morning. And I was thinking, okay, maybe it's a good thing for Labour to be the face of this protest so that there's some kind of coordination. Because if the protests continue to, uh, you, know, you know, steer up here and there and there is no coordination, it could spill a lot of control. But if Labour were to be on the face of it, maybe there will be some control, maybe there will be some coordination nation and there will be safety and there will be purpose to the entire protest thing but where do we now have a situation where there is coordination lapse sincerely i don't know what to say that's my take from the front page of the nigerian observer well, this morning. but the question will then be all the protests that labor has been the face of what did the common man get out of it food for thought well not to worry we're back in a moment to take you through uh Lead stories this morning on the program, so stay on with us. Party, who's your guy? Our Lumi Day, My good people of Labour Party, I thank Una for all the support. Where Una they give Una guy and brother. Since the nomination for governor primary for Labour Party starts for Edo State. As it can be so, this one not to let Una all know say the time for action don't come or make Una all go out tomorrow, Tuesday, February 20th, 2024, to all Una World Office to go take part and vote for the World Congress where Labour Party won't do tomorrow by 9 o'clock in gang for morning. If you don't know your World Office, make you call your World Chairman to show you the place. I beg my people, we all must come out to vote to make sure say our guy, Una guy, we ready to take Labour Party to government house. We know. Area, who is your guy? Labour Party for whatever. Bam. Hi. Now, let me tell you about Safari Valley Eco Resort, the first of its kind in West Africa. Upon your arrival, you are introduced to your butler, who plans your itinerary. We were surrounded by wildlife from the moment we entered the eco park. So many activities, all in the same premises. You visit the gym or the stables, they have it all. At my break, I'm able to practice my putting. We also went fishing on a man made canal. Our tour guides taught us so much about the wildlife and how to interact with them. They used all 
only electric vehicles here. This creates a serene environment. I'm told it's over a thousand acres. My cabin here sits on two acres with a large terrace space overlooking my private swimming pool. Now this is royalty. They have their own farms, thousands of fruit trees. I can also have my lunch here at the waterfall. Quite a beautiful place you have here. Visit Safari Valley Eco Resort in Ghana, bringing you closer to nature. Dr. Omar Ardo Book Launching Committee invites the general public to the public presentation event of the book, Court and Politics, date Saturday 24th February 2024, time 10am prompt, venue Yer Adwa Center, Wusuzun 4 Abuja, special guest of honor, Chief Olusha Gumabasanjo, GCFR, Chairman of the occasion, Professor Angu Abdullahi, CON. Guest of honor, Senator Doye Diri, Governor, Bayelsa State. Real Father of the Day, Al Haji Barkindu Aliyu Mustafa, PhD, the Lamido Fambina. Elder Statesman of the Day, Al Haji Tanko Yakasai, OFR. Book presenter, His Excellency Dr. Kwisile Zengwodo, CON. Chief Launcher, Dr. Honorable Abi Precious Sekibo, Achin III of Okrika. Book reviewer, Professor C.J. Dakas, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Announcer, Al-Haji Shehu Musa Gabam, Makaman Tilde, Chairman Steering Committee. Welcome to the future of gold mining with Japal Gold and Ventures PLC, where vision meets innovation. We have a bold vision to become a major player in gold, copper, and lithium mining production and refining globally with a commitment to investing over $600 million within the next five years. With continuous exploration of our strategic mines in Nigeria and other countries in the world, targeting production and measured reserve of at least 30 million ounces of gold by 2028 with a world-class gold refinery. Having already secured about 650,000 ounces of gold, presently worth about $1.3 billion in one of our gold mines, we shall scale up to 100 million ounces of gold in reserve and production on or before the year 2033. Japal Gold in New Dawn, shaping the future of minerals mining in Nigeria and other parts of the world. Japal, partnering for results. In this era of recovery, ability to engage virtual stakeholders successfully could be a veritable source of sustainable competitive advantage. Embark on a transformative journey with Texam's effective leadership in a distributed world program. Join us from 9th to 23rd March 2024 for a dynamic three-week online experience and a three-day face-to-face session in the UK. This program will be delivered by illustrious Oxford-trained professor Roger Delves, London Business School alumnus Professor Paul Griffith, and Oscar winning ambassador Charles Crawford. Secure 25% early bird discount. Pay 2,407,500 Naira for online and 7,864,500 Naira for the UK and online sessions. Achieve, optimize and win with Texam. For more information, email exec at texam.co.uk or call plus 44-7425. 8-8-3-7-9-1. Texum. Insights that inspire. Actions that change the world. to save our country from fiscal catastrophe. One of those decisions was the removal of fuel subsidy, which had become an unsustainable financial burden 
on our country for more than four decades. Another was the removal of the chokehold of few people on our foreign exchange system that benefited only the rich and the most powerful among us. Without doubt, these two decisions brought some discomfort to individuals, families, and businesses. I am well aware that for some time now, the conversations and debate have centered on the rising cost of living, high inflation, which is now above 28%, and the unacceptable eye on the employment rate. All right, welcome back to Sunrise Daily. So, yes, indeed, uh, discussing that matter and sundry issues. And so, Peter Salah joins us this morning, former president of TUC, amongst others. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on the program today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, people need to blow their cheeks out because many don't know where to turn. Because whichever way they turn, no solace for a lot of them. But recently, NATO say they are going to suspend loading and all of how they work. Definitely, if that happens, then it will affect the cost of the products and availability, ultimately. At the moment, we understand that Amity was deadlocked, so we're hoping that they will continue today and see if they could find a solution. But if you could, first of all, give us uh, maybe a bird's eye view, because, I mean, you've had several unions. Why is it, for instance, in this particular case, where they say they're going to embark on strike? Is it with the aim, even though that's what they say, of calling attention and addressing the challenge? Many always ask, when they embark on these kinds of strike, how does it affect the bottom line, the cost of living in this case? Any bearing whatsoever? Uh, thank you for having me once again. Uh, one of the things that is clear from what is happening now is that uh, you were talking about cost of living. What NATO is also talking about is cost of servicing. So NATO actually provides services that is in terms of truck haulage, moving products from one part of the country to another. And they are talking, what they are saying now is that the cost of doing that is, is high for them. So they want uh, freight charges to be increased. And if you look at the various uh, things that, that make it easier for you to move product from point A to point B, it's diesel. And the price of diesel keep going up because of uh, we all know what's happening to to Naira and the dollar. And majorly we buy, you buy this product in dollars and you have to sell in Naira. So at the end of the day, the prices are going to skyrocket. So that is the, is the main area that NATO is talking about. It's not really just looking at cost of living, but okay. they also are, next men, they want to survive. So the thing is this, if at the end of the day, the freight services, the cost increases, isn't that going to ultimately trickle down and then affect the pump price of petrol? Of course it will. Of course, uh, you, the president, I, I watched the video you played where the president made reference to the fact that uh, uh, they can no longer uh, accept uh, subsidy payment. So once you take that off, everything is going to be affected. So now the only person bringing in, or the only institution or organization bringing in uh, product into the country, importing product, is actually an NPC. You don't have any private players there. They can't survive and they can't play in that space. So... Can we then say, would it be fair to say then that in this case, NATO is just being, they're looking out for themselves, but maybe put differently, just being selfish because it will affect all of us if the power prices go up. But again, if you, if you say that, I think you'd also not be fair to them because first they have to be in business. You see, it's the responsibility of NATO, first of all, to look at their business. If their business is failing and they just know that they need to survive. And so it's the responsibility of government. You see, one other thing that we do very well is that we, we take away the people who are responsible for running the economic space, and then we start blaming the parts. So NATO wants to survive. You want to survive. I want to survive. So what we have now is everybody's looking out for himself, but it's the responsibility of government to look, to look out for everyone, okay. to create that space for every one of us to try. So again... Haven't been there because you know how all of this, no matter how they try to hide some words or play with words, you know you can differentiate what the real deal is. So, from what you've seen out there, do you think fuel subsidy is back? Fuel subsidy is back. There is no, there is no, this is not something we should be arguing about. 
first subsidy is back, and it's even back in in full force. It's wow. even, if, if the government wants to be open, the government will tell you that they haven't paid more than they were paying uh, about three, four, five months ago. So first subsidy is back in, in full swing. Wow. Does it mean that the PIA, no matter what that says, look, it's not in this particular case, because at the point when the president came up and said no more fuel subsidy, it was because before then, much as the PIA was there, the former president suspended implementing that part. And then this president came up and said, well, it's back, meaning he lifted that suspension. So now you're saying all his comments notwithstanding, subsidy is back. Now, just, let's just do simple, simple arithmetic. When he became Oh yeah, I think it's frozen, but don't worry. About seven hundred, but about seven hundred, a little about seven hundred fifty naira. Mm -hmm. So now what you have now is that it's about a thousand five hundred naira. I'm telling you about the official price. So if you are looking at the thousand five hundred, what you have right now is that you can't six hundred, six hundred and thirty naira. No way, no way. That's the actual price. Mm -hmm. Landing cost right now should be about one thousand twenty nine naira. So what you should be paying for a liter of petrol should be between one thousand two fifty or one thousand three hundred. So if I may understand this um, with the request of NATO, because you, you've said that NATO, they're freight dealers. Everyone knows that they carry heavy-duty uh, mm -hmm. products. They're, they're heavy-duty heavy vehicle users, which use diesel. Diesel is already deregulated. Mm -hmm. um, and in all fairness, the federal government might still be subsidizing petrol, but they have since hands off diesel. And... You know, if those who are using diesel, even for businesses, I mean, who are running generators, are complaining bitterly about this particular situation. So what precisely is the quarrel of NATO? Because if the price of diesel has gone up, naturally, the cost of their freight services will go up. Is it that those who are owing them are refusing to pay? Or what exactly is the problem? Yeah, the problem now is that what they want or what they are requesting for the payment that they want, those who are behind it uh, are not willing to pay because that is also going to be, it's also going to be part of the subsidy that you are going to pay. It's also going to balloon the subsidy. So if you are not paying what NATO is asking for, and that's why they want to withdraw their truck, just don't worry about NATO telling you about it is the cost of living they want to draw attention to. No, it's not the cost of living, it's the cost of services. They want more money for the services that I provide. Yes, diesel has been deregulated, but that does not mean that with the with the flip flop from naira to dollar, flip flop that we're having in naira to dollar conversion, is not also affecting diesel. So that's why you have NATO also coming out to say, please, we also want part of the pie, and you have workers also coming out to say we also want more money for minimum wage. So you also have the public complaints commission. I just saw it on your news also saying they will go on strike. So what we have now is everybody wanting to survive, asking for more money to survive. We are in a very, very tight, very, will I say, dad, dad doesn't even begin to carry the weight of where we are. You know, when you've used a lot of words, uh, you think about the whole situation of the country, you, 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 maybe we should coin a new word to carry the weight of what it is, uh, of, of where we are. I'm also looking at it from your own analysis. I mean, we have been on this subsidy debate for many years. I mean, federal government needs to take away subsidy. It's not sustainable. Eventually, on the, on the 29th of May, the president, current president, made that pronouncement, fuel subsidy is gone. And everyone was wondering, okay, so there was mixed reactions to it. Oh, it should have been better planned. Or some people said, no, it should have been taken away because if, if we had tried to plan it, we will never do it because when we look at what the consequences will be, which is what we're all reaping now, maybe it would never have been done. But looking at where we currently are, looking at how our Naira is tanking against the dollar, uh, do you think that we could have done this differently? Now, what we are experiencing now is 29th of May this year, I'm just doing a review earlier in the week, 29th of May this year will be 25th anniversary of democracy. And I asked myself, what serious problem affecting Nigeria has any government solved in Nigeria? Now, in 1999, no refineries was working. And this is 2024, we still don't have any refinery that is working. So when you don't plan, this is what you get. So what is happening, whether this government, the previous government, everybody's reacting. So when you react, you, are no, you can't think properly. 
So that is where we are right now. Whether they say we, whether it's a, it should have been done properly or not done properly, one thing is very clear. People are not planning. People in government, we are not thinking. When when we were in, in, in when I was leading the union, we, we told the government, why don't you do the LNG model, which is 5149? Allow a private private sector to drive those refineries. And then when you do that, then it becomes for them to want to make profit. Prof, private sector will always want to make profit. So government refused. But for whatever pecuniary interest, government didn't do it. So we have Buhari government who came up and telling who told us that they will build two refineries. Eight years they did nothing. So what we have now, this current administration, is as if it's a tsunami of economic challenges that this current administration is going to face. And it does, it does not look any, any time, it does not look like it's going to go away anytime soon. Because we have not planned, therefore, this is what we will face. So for me, nothing is happening in Nigeria right now that is surprising me at all. Okay. Um, and I think of a number of people too, you know, I mean, we've seen some <coughs> editorials and some commentary in, in, in that regard. However, I mean, I don't think that even if nothing is surprising you, I don't think you saw it happening like this. A situation whereby, yes, we knew that the Naira was going to depreciate somewhat against the dollar, especially when we're not earning as much as we ought to. But if we give this a, a period, I mean, our crude oil proceeds, we're still struggling to make 2 million barrels per day. We're currently doing maybe about 1.4. <coughs> That's what we were told recently. We're still struggling with those who are stealing <coughs> um, our crude oil. Um, and then when you even think about the fact that more than half of it, we've, we've promised, you know, upfront to, to debtors, you now begin to ask, you know, where precisely what exactly is left. But this is the situation that we have found ourselves. I'm just wondering, do you think there's anything that we can tweak Anything that can be done differently, well, when we look at what is currently happening, the current situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the complaints and the, you know, the, the, the problems that people are currently um, facing today, we've just been able to earn their daily bread. Now, the, the, you just made reference to crude oil theft. Oh, but crude oil theft is not like walking into a gas station and buying petrol. For you to go to steal right now, why I said most of this is not surprising to me, if you look at Nigerian budget, you, you, you have to go to the base to find out that, okay, this budget, was it, what, what is it, what's the foundation of this budget? 400,000 barrels a day is still being stolen on the average. We cannot account for 400,000 barrels of crude a day. So ask me, is it the man, the man or the woman in Balogo market that will move crude oil? No. How many people have been prosecuted for stealing crude? None. Even if you, you, you are a government and you care, for somebody, for you to be, let's even say 100,000 barrels that is being stolen at $70 per day. You are losing 100,000 barrels at $70 per day. That is even a, not just an economic threat, it's also a threat to national security. Because if somebody has such an amount of money, he can do anything to undermine government. So what will government do? First of all, government need to arrest and address whoever is behind those crude oil theft. But we all know that crude oil theft, powerful people are behind it. Then you ask yourself, the second thing you also need to ask yourself is, what is the main challenge facing the average Nigerian right now? For you to have cost of living skyrocketing, the main engine room is the movement of goods and services, which is transportation. It's not just about federal government. Let's ask ourselves, what are the state governors doing? It's a failure of governors at all tiers of, of, the, of the federation. Federal government, state government, and local government, they both failed in addressing the, the, the challenges that Nigerians are facing. Now, it is not the responsibility of federal government to provide local transportation to move people from point A to point B. There is no single state that you say have a whole design, a wholly designed transport system management in the federation. And yet we all know that subsidy is going to go. And the first place, first place where subsidy goes that will take the heat is transportation. 70% of people's monthly wage right now goes into transportation. So what is the state government or the local government doing? From the, from the advent of this administration, the revenue accruing to state and local government has increased, has doubled. So if the revenue has doubled, has the services been provided to the citizenry by the state and local government, has their life also gotten better? So those are questions we need to ask ourselves. 
if we don't have an omnibus plan to address this, and then we are going to wallow in this till God knows when. Hmm. Ayo. Well, thank you, Chamberlain. Well, Mr. Sele, just one, let me, let me begin with a, what, what you might call a difficult question. That was a question uh, Chamberlain, you know, asked just before we concluded the papers, you know, about labor interventions in situations like this, high cost of living and the rest of them. And he asked it, even though philosophically or comically, that it, all the protests that labor has been the face of, what has come out of it, that question, let me put it out. Let me put it to you. What is likely to come out of this protest of NATO? Most of the time, at the end of the day, what we just hear is, okay, there's been a federal government and a labor agreement. Now there is an, a brewing NLC, TUC, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, protest as well. So that question remains. What should Nigerians expect from such a, a protest, such an action as this one that NATO is, has, has embarked on and the one that the NLC and TUC are planning? Now, for the NSC and TUC, for the NSC and TUC, the, the fulcrum for NSC and TUC protest is as let's look at the minimum wage. So the, the, the attention for the NSC and TUC is basically minimum wage. And then for NATO, it's survival of its members. So if we if you have a minimum wage, that minimum wage is going to cut across all sectors of the economy. But for NATO, for NATO is that what they're after is that they want to make sure that the college business is, does not collapse. So that is also an expectation. But it's also the, the, the other challenge that government needs to address is that government needs to wake up and fix a minimum wage. Sometimes I wonder at the National Economic Council what they discuss. Because what I expect to see is that this, when I said I was not, I'm not surprised about what is happening, is that I expected that government at all levels to know that this is going to happen. If you are looking at FX, let's look at FX, for example. If you are laundering money, it goes through the financial system. It goes through the banks. How many banks have been made to pay for supporting money laundering? How many banks have been made to pay for not reporting to NFIU? We are just we are aware now that somebody moved money from, from a government agency to a personal account. Was that not supposed to be reported? It was not reported. So one of the ways to change things is, first of all, you don't need, I don't, I don't believe in when somebody says fight corruption. No, you don't need to. Just allow the law to play its role. HSBC and all, all the all major banks in the world, when they were involved in what they consider to be money laundry, they paid a huge fine. So when the banks know that, oh, if we, if we hold, if we hold uh, dollars, if we, if we allow corrupt politicians to wire money through the system, this is what is, this, these are the sanctions that will be applied. You will find out that things will gradually start improving. Well, Mr. S because... S the, the, the question that I asked you, and I'm, I'm glad, I'm, my apologies for butting in. The, the question is about how these protests will have a reverberating or direct effect on the living standards of people. Well, NATO, as you said, is asking for the welfare of its own members, and that is taken, that is granted. But has NATO also considered that the spiraling effect, in your opinion, of this action that they have taken will only make the uh, cost of living worse for people? Yes. I, if you ask, um, as somebody from that sector who understands what is at play here, is that NATO, first of all, will be very, will look after its own primary interest. So what NATO is looking after now is its own workers, is its own primary interest. And it's the responsibility of government to look at for the interest of the entire citizenry. So there's nothing NATO is doing right now that I'm going to come here and say, oh, NATO, what you are doing is wrong. No. The woman in Balogu market, for example, or my two market, for example, is also going to increase the cost of tomato. It's the way it is. It's the way the world works. It's not left for the institution of the states to make sure that we don't become dog eat dog. Hmm. Okay. Now you talked about the state governors, you know, the other time, and I was very glad that you did. So, what should the state governments have done or be doing to stave off some of these situations? Already, you are aware that spontaneous protests are coming up here and there. The latest is in Ibadan or your state, the state capital. And that is not even the worst um, uh, economically uh, downward place in the whole, or in the whole of your state. What should the state governments 
at various levels be doing right now, either as individual states or as regions in collaboration with each other, to at least ameliorate some of the pains that the people living within their domains are going through? First thing is to have a meeting with National Union of Road Transport Workers. Yes. And see how do we move people from point A to point B at a very subsidized rate. You have to subsidize transportation. If you say you are taking away subsidy and you're not subsidizing transportation, you, you, you are killing your economy. And then let me also give you an example. The EU, for example, we all always talk about, the government in Nigeria always make reference to Europe or America. Last year alone, the French government subsidized electricity to the tune of 40, 45 billion euros. Last year alone. And then the plan was that, oh, they are going to stop it. And they've just announced that they are going to extend it to 2025. So as a government, you look at oh, which of these areas that is most, uh, that my citizens are mostly affected. And then you come up with something. You meet National Union of Road Transport Workers. Okay, how many passengers are you moving? Are you moving in a day? And then how do we make sure that, oh, if, if you pay, workers pay half the price. Not just workers, Nigerians pay half the price. That will stop up, stay up whatever is coming. Because right now, people are frustrated and people are angry. Okay. Well, so, one, other, one other thing in that space, my apologies uh, one more time. One other thing in that space is to even ask the question, what has become of previous interventions of government, particularly in transportation? You would recall that in the, was it the economic sustainability plan of the previous government, they came up with this idea that uh, maybe electric buses or CNG buses are going to be supplied across the country. This government has also promised to make some intervention in the area of transportation. That hasn't moved any needle, has it? The challenge we face is that we, we, we I'm, I'm looking for the right word to use. We sometimes act as if, uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out. It's like uh, taking your burger, putting it in the microwave. That's the way we run a government. And that's the way we are citizens. That's also the way we act. And the politicians know that these are the way Nigerians are. So they come out and they tell you, oh, this is what we are going to do. Nobody's holding them accountable. The media is not talking about it. Nobody's talking. Civil society is not talking about it. Labor unions are not even going back to say, these are the promises you have made to us, and you have not fulfilled these promises. So nobody keeps it in the front burner. So the politicians come out, and they just make some, some comments, and at the end of the day, we clap our hands, and then it is business as usual. So oh, let me give you another example. The previous government, the previous government suspended PIB. But they made a budget. In their budget, they said, okay, the subsidy is still in place. But from my own information, I know there was no money for the subsidy. So when this president came on board, he knew he had no money to pay for the subsidy. And then he just had to go ahead and say, okay, subsidy is gone. But he too also have no plan. So those are the challenges that we are facing until we start holding our politicians accountable for their words and to ensure that what they are saying, they follow it through, they will take us for a ride. And that leads to and this what? last question from me. My apologies again. That leads to this yeah. question, uh, Mr. Sele, the question of engagement. It would seem like, I mean, we have representatives, about yeah. four, almost 500 of them in the National Assembly, and quite a number of them, different levels of representation in the state houses of assembly. Their job yeah. is to interface with their people so that such yeah. things as the protests from NLC and TUC, the protests from NATO do not happen. Now the citizens are angry and unhappy and hungry, as you have also said, and a number of people agree with you. Shouldn't we be engaging constructively and effectively so that at least we can calm some tensions? What, are the, what should the representatives of these people at the various levels be doing now, at least to calm some tensions? Because in most cases, there is no engagement from these representatives. There is no engagement because they, they don't think they should engage. The reason why they, they are elected for them is that it is my turn. So whether it's a senator, whether it's members of the State House of Assembly, or anyone, nobody cares. What you should be having right now is to be having a series of town hall meetings from members of this, whether State House of Assembly, House of Rep, or Senate, or, or the senators. One thing is very clear. The people don't need government to survive. Government cannot give legitimacy to the people. It is the people that give legitimacy to government. So what one would have expected government to do right now is that the senators and the House of Rep members, the State House of Assembly members, to now go ahead, engage the people, and then also hear from the people the challenges they are facing. And sometimes you can also get ideas from the people. I'll give you, if, if we have the time, I'll just tell you a story of someone who had a poultry farm. And then he had his poultry farm, 
with about 30,000 beds, and then somebody from local government went there and shut it down. And then the guy went to the council to, to, to talk to them and said, okay, fine, why are you doing this? And then they said, you need to pay X, Y, Z. And he said, okay, did you even know the number of people in that locality, the number of poultry farms in that locality, what quantity of eggs they produce? The local government chairman is not aware. Nobody knew about this. So because of the value that has been placed on our politicians, they see every opportunity as an opportunity for them to live their life. Not opportunity for service. If it's an opportunity for service, by now senators, there would have been a break in the National Assembly or in the various status of assembly for elected members to engage their constituent. And then have a feedback and then now make a law. All the laws that we make is just somebody waking up and making laws. The only thing I can remember National Assembly for from 1999 to date is that every subsequent National Assembly, the first thing to do is to pass a law to amend it to the Constitution. Mr. Sale, do you think Mr. that? Sale, do you think that if the labor unions were to protest and say, "Look, the local governments have got to have this autonomy. The states have got to ensure that certain laws or the lawmakers put certain laws in place." Wouldn't it make a huge impact, at least starting from there? It will. It, it, will, make, it will make a huge impact. But what we need to ask ourselves is, that, is that the policy of the state? Is that the policy of those who have been elected? You see, one of the things you also you must find out about politicians, we are in that state now whereby people are thinking through their religion, people are thinking through their ethnicity. Instead of people to be thinking about what and who will put food on my table. So when you don't have that, then these are the challenges that you are going to face. Yeah, there are also areas that I feel that labor have not done enough. And I've also spoken to them informally uh, behind the scene to say, in the last eight years, I think labor went to sleep. We didn't do enough in, in, the, in the administration of Buh uh, Buhari administration. So they didn't do enough. And one of the things that labor should do is that labor is a, first and foremost is a pressure group. It's not only one of the reasons why we are protesting is to draw attention to your challenge. And then the second one, labor must have network. They must want to build, a, 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 I'm happy somebody made reference to engagement. Before you come out in the open, you would have been able to have your own plan. It's not just labor coming to say, oh, we want, to, we want you to pay 500,000 naira minimum wage. But you must also be able to design the effect and the impact of that money on the economy. Can we survive it? Can we sustain it? And then can the informal sector also pay it? Government is the single largest employer. Yes. But the informal sector employs more people than government. So you also need to ask yourself, can the informal sector pay, pay that amount of money that you're asking for? When, when I was president, we had to get the informal sector involved and we said, can you pay, how much can you pay? And they said, okay, fine. At the end of the day, we agreed for 18,000 Naira, which was equivalent to by $150 then. So labor also need to sit up and also put, go to his research department. Labor has research department and come up with its own metrics of progress. Not just to bang the table, not just to want to shut down the streets. No, you must also have an economic plan for the country. You must have a network of people that you engage. Yeah. And it's only when everything has broken down, then you come to the open and say, we have met this at 9 p.m. or 11 p.m. last night. This is what came out. And for the following reason, this is why we are going on strike. I've not seen any, any of these national officers on channels, on Arise, or any of these major, major TV networks to now address issues and say, this is why we are doing what we are going to do. Uh. Labor must educate, sensitize, and inform Nigerians on what they are about to do, even three weeks, one month, two months before going ahead to do it. Yeah, I think that's a fine place, you know, to let it go. So we're hoping that Labor will pick up the gauntlet and do what they have to do. Always a pleasure to have you on, Peter Seller, former president of Trade Union Congress. Thank you for having me. All right, so business news will be on top of the hour, but we'd like to also remind ourselves of this uh, comments that came through from Pastor Sam Adeyemi at the time. We have to bring human psychology into this. What actually drives most people in the country? What drives most of the people in leadership right now? Money. 
money. Um, there's a book, Culture Matters. It's, you know, the compilation of the presentations at a symposium held at Harvard University many years ago. They were checking the relationship between culture and development. They checked the factors that shape people's thinking and values. Prevailing ideas about prosperity came number one. Nigerians are not foolish. The instinct for survival is the strongest. The people you are asking to collaborate, the only collaboration that makes sense to them is how they make more money. I promise you that. All the uh, contracts going out of the MDAs and so on, even the oversight functions from the National Assembly, it's money driving it. That's why vision is very important from a leader. You've got to sell that idea, transfer that idea into people's hearts about where we're going and how we will get there. It is that where we're going that will give the motivation to people to sacrifice. Okay. The people in leadership need to make sacrifices now before that collaboration can happen. But I promise you, most people in leadership right now are not thinking sacrifice. They are thinking survival. Challenging thoughts there from Pastor Sam Adeyemi, thinking survival instead of uh, leadership and all. But good morning and welcome to the business morning side of Sunrise Daily. And as usual, we'll go around the world of business and settle in Nigeria, beginning with what's going on in the global oil space. We can tell you that prices were broadly steady on Tuesday, hovering close to three-week highs on heightened Middle East tensions and recovering China demand. Uh, looking at the prices uh, on the board right here, uh, it's down for Brent, 0.12% uh, in the red at $83.46 a barrel, while WTI is on the flip side at uh, $79.46 after it gained 0.34%. An unusual uh, relationship we see there. Normally it's on the same, in the same direction, but this one we'll see uh, that is inverse. Well, uh, we can tell you that the contract uh, that expire during the day today, uh, that's, and then we're beginning with the April contract later on today up till tomorrow. There was no settlement for WTI uh, on Monday. That's because of that's U.S. public holiday. Even the markets didn't trade yesterday in the United States. Iran allied uh, Houthis continue their attacks on shipping lanes in the Red Sea and Bab al Madab Strait, with, all, uh, with at least four more vessels hit by drone and missile strikes since Friday. Tourism revenues in China have surged 47.3% year on year and rose above pre COVID levels during the National Lunar. New Year holiday that just ended over the weekend. Uh, those are some of the factors driving the price of global oil at this time. We just shift a bit to grains and see that Chicago soybean features gained on ground on Tuesday with the market climbing to its highest level in almost one week on the back of short covering, although rising global supplies kept a lid on prices, which dropped to its lowest level in three months and pressure from abundant Black Sea supplies while corn rose. And uh, looking at the numbers right there, soybeans is up 1% at $11.84 for a quarter of a bushel. That's for soybeans. The Chicago Board of Trade was up uh, for that amount, and that's the highest since uh, Valentine's Day. Uh, looking at wheat now, wheat slid. It was down 0.3% to $5.57 for a quarter of a bushel after dropping earlier in the session uh, uh, to $5.55. That's talking about wheat. That's the lowest since November 16. Corn now. Corn is on, on the other side. It added 0.5%. Uh, and then to $4.18 for three quarter of a bushel. Large speculators increased their net short position in CBOT corn features in the week ended February the 13th. 
Welcome to Nigeria. Times are indeed hard. Uh, here of protests everywhere now, uh, well, almost everywhere, uh, we've had from the north. It seems it's the turn, the turn of uh, the south, the southern part of the country. Uh, yesterday was Ibadan, the capital of Oyo State. The residents there, uh, they joined that trend, they trooped out and uh, peacefully protest against economic realities in the country. The protesters converged on the Iwo Road, Songo and Mokola were seen carrying placards with different inscriptions depicting their agitations. Our correspondent over there, Bukola Oriowo, sent in this report. The harsh economic realities across Nigeria has led to protests in parts of the country to register the grievances of Nigerians who are struggling to survive. Latest entrants in this set of protests are residents of the Badadeo state capital in a peaceful protest carrying placards and chanting songs to register their displeasure at government actions and inaction. <laughs> The procession which assembled at Mokola moved to Sango, Bodija Market and parts of Agudi. They are calling on the government to, as a matter of urgency, do something to ameliorate the hard economic realities being faced by many Nigerians who could barely feed. The protesters were joined by some traders at the Bodija Market, showing solidarity to their cause. People are hungry. People are dying daily of hunger. Insecurity is killing people. We just need them to help us. They should just help us. They should just look into our case and be of help to Nigerians. That's just all, all we need. Section 34, 39 and 40 empowers every Nigerian to organize a peaceful assembly and to speak about the economic hardship. On this note, this is not today's own. We are starting. This is just the start. It is a continuous action. Expect protest from any angle. It must not be me. It can be you. It is everybody because the problem does only affect only me. Neither are it affects everyone. Security was beefed up across strategic points in the state capital to ensure that the protest is not hijacked by hoodlums. We understand that uh, people have rights uh, for uh, this kind of thing, but it is our duty as law enforcement to ensure that it is not hijacked by unscrupulous and mischievous um, elements who might want to make uh, criminal proceeds from uh, this kind of situation. As you can see uh, from Mokola, which was the starting point of uh, uh, this movement, uh, the police has covered, I mean, by foot and, you know, even with vehicles, you know, uh, following them step by step. Um, the command uh, would like to let the good people of Oyo State know, particularly residents, that we have their interest at heart and we will do all that it takes to ensure that the relative peace and tranquility in all your state remains as it is. Similar protests held at Songo and Iwo Road areas within Ibadan, the your state capital. They hope that the government would consider this protest and do something to reduce the suffering of Nigerian masses. Bukola Uriwu, Channel Television News. So there you have it. Uh, it. This is not the planned uh, labor. Uh, they have theirs, uh, well, slated for next week. We don't know if it's going to hold or if the government will intervene before that. But we've been seeing these protests come from different parts of the country. Uh, we don't have a face to it. I guess it's also important to note that because if it's coming from the organized labor, then we say, oh, it's the NLC or the TUC, get the TUC president. But this it seems... People are hungry. People are frustrated. People want to work. There's no security to do what they want to do. There's no power. There's no Naira. So I guess it's time that the government will also get desperate in finding a solution before this gets out of hand. I guess that's really important. Uh, not I guess. I think that's what should be done because it's staring us in the face. We are all feeling it. Our purchasing power is eroding every day. How much is a dollar now? 
1,600, 1,700. Anyways, uh, let's talk to an economist who perhaps can help us delve into this and tell us more about what can be done, what should be done. The Chief Executive Officer of Financial Derivatives Company, Mr. Bismarck Rowani. Uh, Mr. Rowani, good morning. We see this protest and we heard one of them saying there that this is just the beginning and that is scary because if this escalates, we do not know you know, how it could be controlled. And that's dangerous for the economy and for everyone. You said it right. It's, it's dangerous. And um, it didn't start in one day. There's been an economic deterioration, what we call the economic decay curve. And this has happened and is happening. And what is happening is that as long as people do not see hope, do not feel that there's hope and that there's a solution coming, and they do not believe whatever solutions are being suggested, then they become hopeless. Hopelessness is the beginning of desperation. A desperate man is a dangerous man, and a dangerous man can do anything. So I think it's not anything that is being underestimated. It's only that uh, it, it, the administration and policymakers have to understand that this, like, this is a very, very, very difficult and dangerous situation. Having said that, let us look at what exactly what are the symptoms, what are the causes, and then what are the solutions? The symptoms of this is that the Naira traded yesterday night as, as low as 1,800, that is 1,800 Naira to a dollar. And the uh, nothing market, it closed at about almost 1,600. The custom duty rate, conversion rate, is about 1,582 Naira. The um, international air transport, that is IATA ticket rates, was at 1650 naira, 1650 naira to a dollar. So these are just indications of what it is. Why is this happening? There's the dollar cash market, and then there's the dollar liquidity market. The dollar liquidity market is where oil, oil, oil flows, investment flows come into the market, and it is used for letters of credit for trade activities. The dollar cash market is one which you and I go and buy from the Malams, from the BDCs. What happened in, in the last a couple of days, is that the EFCC has been chasing these guys, the BDCs, with these paltry amounts that they have. That has actually helped to drive down the amount of liquidity in the market and make the Naira actually grossly uh, undervalued. In other words, it has made the Naira to, to lose its value in the market. Two, the central bank issued a gu guidelines that you can no longer buy cash from the banks. You have to, if you're traveling, you have to have electronic transfers and all of that. That cash amount that people used to buy, they use part of it and they sell part of it or they, they part of it goes in the market, has actually reduced supply of dollar cash in the market. So one, chasing the people around, two, the guidelines, and three, the fact that the dollar, people, people's expectation that the Naira will continue to deteriorate consistently. So there's uh, expectations, there's actual liquidity crunch, and thirdly, there's the illicit factor. Those are the things that are causing this. Now, how does that feed into inflation? Is it inflation that causes a weak currency, or is it a weak currency that causes inflation? Anyway, who cares about that? The truth is that on one hand, you are buying dollars at 1,800. On the other hand, you are buying cement at 10,000 naira a bag. All, even though cement is all produced domestically, the limestone and everything, but one is having an impact on the other. So that is precisely where we are. What does it mean? It means that they are accused for petrol because of strike, their prices are increasing, and people are under pressure. And you saw it in, in Niger State, you saw it in Orion State, you've seen it in Canada in different places. So people are under pressure, and they want to, want to see some relief, and they want to hear some credible policy moves that will make them feel a little bit hopeful that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. I think that is... That's how I can summarize the show about it. Yeah, but when we talk about, you talked about giving hope to the people. We've had, yes. uh, you know, a couple of statements talking about the cement yesterday and uh, there was a meeting with stakeholders and the federal government and I think they agreed on 8,000 naira. Uh, but, but I've got, as you would say, <laughs> you know, this thing cannot be artificial. It's not decreed. They have, you have to deal with the factors that lead to it. But on the other hand, we've also had the president release from the reserve grain. We've had uh, state governors also make declarations and, and all of that. But people are still desperate. Is there something we are missing here to bring calm to the situation? 
uh, because we do know, obviously, the time between the uh, announcement of a, of a policy uh, or, and the implementation and when the impact will actually spread to the people, there's always a gap there. Yeah, there's a lag, what we call the lags. No, but the truth is that, one, let us look at the materiality of 100,000 tons. 100,000 tons of grain, wherever it is, and if, if that is available, reality, if, if those grains actually exist in the silos, it's not enough to feed Lagos for two days. Not to talk of feeding Nigeria. It's not going to make a difference. Not one hell of a difference. Not. So let's talk about this thing ourselves. Let's, let's deal with productivity issues. And you can use the entire police force in Nigeria to, to break up the supermarkets, to bring them to... Those goods will not... The price of goods are determined by market forces. You cannot create artificial prices. We did this 40 years ago, 50 years ago. It failed then. It will fail again. The reality is that allow the prices of goods be determined, and then supply, when supply increases, price of goods come down, when demand increases, and the demand is a function of the Naira liquidity we have. So now there was a treasury uh, bond auction yesterday of 2.5 trillion Naira. That is about 3.5% of total money supply. If you take that out of the system, you have actually reduced the amount of money in its circulation. You have also increased interest rates, which has a, a negative impact on stock prices. The stock market fell by 3.5% yesterday. And it's going to fall again today, but at least almost 4 or 5%. So, to, so the economy is become, coming to equilibrium. But let us not deceive ourselves that there's a quick fix for this. Some things are now moving in the right direction, but very, very slowly. What the people want are, let us see the supply of the goods. Let's stop, let's stop making fake false promises. Two, let us begin to see that government expenditure and lavish lifestyle of government officials is toned down, toned down. First of all, let us be honest with the people. Secondly, let us turn down our lavish lifestyles so that there's equal sacrifice amongst both policymakers, regulators, market players, and everybody. There's too much um, opulence and ostentation at a time of hunger and des uh, desperation. Mm. Yeah, and uh, you're not talking about being honest with the people because uh, there's the issue of subsidy, uh, both for petrol and for electricity. And uh, uh, I mean, if the government says subsidy is gone, and then, uh, I mean, we calculate <laughs> and find that there's still subsidy. And even Bretton Woods institutions are telling us your government has come back uh, on paying subsidy. And now IMF is saying that uh, inflation might hit 44%. And uh, just a couple of days ago, AFDB had warned that there would be even more protests. Uh, would you say that the government is actually being desperate about its moves to handle this with all of these warnings that we see staring us in the face? Uh, no, I, I, I don't think the question is about how desperate government is. It's about how honest... First of all, do you understand the um, complexity of the problem? And two, are you honest with the solutions that you're offering? And three, do the people believe, even if you're honest, and the, do the people believe it? That is, it is that disconnection you are seeing out there. And so there has to be some clarity. There has to be some, just not just clarity, honesty, and understanding of the complexity of the problems. It's not, these problems are not going to go away. You know, we can do, we can say all we want to do. They, they will only go away when there's a concerted, comprehensive effort to resolve them. And so, the, the, what you are seeing today is an economy which is being strangulated. And, and when, you are, when you are strangulated, you are being choked, right? The people are being choked, their pockets being choked in their stomachs, and being choked in their respiratory system. That is where and anybody in that situation will do anything and everything to get oxygen and to get food and to get fuel. But having said that, I said it from the beginning that subsidies never went anywhere. It was reduced. And of course, I was chastised as being a prophet of doom at that time. Now it has come clear, and everybody has come back to say it nine months later that subsidies are back. You only come back if you've gone. If you didn't go, then you, didn't, you are still in it. You're looking there. So now let us accept our reality that we are going to sequence this thing. Subsidies, there's subsidies and the use of the proceeds of subsidies. So even, the, even if you've reduced it, what have you used it for? 
All right? And how efficient is that use and what is the impact of that use? That is critical. Two, subsidies are only one element and they are reverse taxes. There are a whole lot of things in the economic system, the macroeconomic system, that needs to be in equilibrium. Those things are not easy. They are very abstract. The only way you can understand it is, okay, what is the price of egg? You know that in the last two days, Olam and Premier Feed said, we are not going to buy maize and sorghum anymore because if we buy maize and sorghum at these prices, the price of an egg, you know, the tray of eggs of 30, is going to go to 10,000 or 5,000, you know, it's now 4,000 plus. So what are the people doing? People are killing the layers and then just selling the eggs. And so that is a warning of things to come. But I think there's been a reaction. The price of sorghum and, and maize has actually come down somewhat because nobody's, the, the big boys are refusing to buy it. But in the meantime, it has created some shortages of food, eggs, and so on. So we, it, it is true that there will be some adjustments. It is true that the people are now demanding good governance. And in economics, once the demand increases, the supply must increase. The demand for good governance means that the supply of good governance and honesty will, will follow. And you will see that government and policymakers are going to have to supply honesty. They are going to have to supply good governance and they are going to have to reduce that profile of ostentatious living so that everybody is carrying the burden equally. That is the only way out. Mm. All right, uh, we'll be looking forward to that. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Financial Derivatives Company. Thank you for having me. So government is on you, federal government, state governors. Here you go. <laughs> Can you cut down on your expenses and let uh, those resources drill down, you know, to the people, get the protesters off the streets. These are not political. These are hungry Nigerians. You need to get close to them and you would see that these are hungry Nigerians who want food, who want security. And I bet if there was security in most of our rural areas, you know, those states where food comes from, up north, Plateau, Benue, Niger, I bet about 50% of this inflation would go down because uh, more than 50% of our inflation number is driven by food inflation. So imagine that we had supply. And yes, the CPN governor had said that we should reduce our desire and demand for imported goods. Where do we start from? Can we start with him? We'll find out. <laughs> well, let's head to the market now and see. I saw uh, Mr. Rani obviously said what happened at the NGX yesterday. It was uh, down 3.15%. Uh, it was a shocker to me, actually, because by intraday, we had the OSHA index above 106,000. And by the close of trade, it was 102,000. I wonder what happened. Let's have Abdul Rashid Momo uh, uh, join us now, perhaps. Uh, he's a prophet. He uses his graph and his crystal ball. Uh, Mr. Momo, good morning. What happened to the market? Just within two or three hours, we lost about 4,000 uh, on our index points. Okay, good morning. Um, what happened yesterday was uh, the market actually dipped. You know, when the heavyweight sneezes, the whole market catch is cold. Um, there were two major movements in the market, which was led, I think, um, Dangsem lost 10%, then um, I think MTM2 lost, they both lost 10%. So those, those, those two alone um, actually plunged the market down by about 3,000 points. Then I think um, MBL2 dropped yesterday by about 9.08%. Oh, so those were the major uh, people that actually moved the market down. Mm. But again, technically, right, um, let's say since um, the end of January, you know, we've had this longer rally since uh, December into uh, the months of February and January. So what we have now is that the market is actually in a corrective stage. And, stage. and um, the only... What I'm watching is that the market must not go below 100,000 points. The index must not go below 100,000 points because 100,000 points is a very strong support level. Anything below that will put the market more into a corrective um, phase because, as I said, the early rallies we saw was really on the high side. And for every rally, there will always be a correction. So 
um, for any investor that sees the correction to the downside, uh, it's, it's, it's expected. Mm. So um, what we are seeing is a normal mm. market mm. phenomenon. Can we, can we connect it to the auction that took place at the fixed income market yesterday? Can we say that, uh, I mean, the returns there caught the investors' attention? Yeah, to some extent, um, you know, what, um, there are two scenarios I want to paint here. You know, people that suffered the 2008 crash in the market, when the market crashed in 2008, we saw a lot of outflow, we see a lot of outflow from, let's say, old investors, and we see a lot of inflow from new investors, you know? So most of the clients we asked why they said they were moving their money either to dollar market they are moving to um, go to buy um, from the bonds and everything they are doing they're moving their money to the money market for higher rates or basically to just play safe in the market since they've made so much money in the market. So uh, for it, so what I can say that like from our end we have a lot of cash flow for clients but we are not really in the market now we need to know. Uh, the right direction before we can go back into the market because you need to be sure cash is king now. If your money is not in dollar, your money will be safe. <laughs> I mean, investment. But at the same time, at the same time, uh, the market rallies. I mean, you can make, you can, I mean, example, you can see stocks like Irigun for the past how many days? I mean, he, there's no investment that can beat that now. I mean, yeah, I mean, that stock has been moving from, um, I think, I'm talking about from February, that was the 5th of February, it was about 568, now it traded about 950. There's no investment that can beat that. So the stock market is still opening, yeah, there's still, I mean, there's still opening that no other financial um, market can actually beat. Yeah. But for now, it's more of Correction. There are still good rallies to be made. Even even the MBL that's on the downside. I always tell people the strategy is always buy in weakness and sell in strength. So even the uh, Nigerian business, I say, with the bad result, it's a strong brand. The possibility that uh, we we'll see people actually buying into the tips. All right, all right, uh, Mr. Momo. Thank you so much for thank that. You uh, your critical yeah. analysis of the market. Thank, thank you, and have a great thank trading you. day. Yeah, thanks. All right, uh, just before we hand over back to the Sunrise Daily team, uh, let's uh, look at those numbers. You already saw the numbers for uh, the NGX. It was in red yesterday. It was really bloody yesterday. I tell you, all the counters in red. The market lost 3.15% uh, are going to 56 just 56 trillion, uh, you see there, 0 0.28, that was down. I lost 1.82 trillion Naira uh, from the market correction, as Mr. Momo would say. But I guess some investors found the auction at the fixed income uh, really interesting. If we look at the activity charts, it was red, just one uh, green there uh, of the deals, but the sectors uh, had blood from head to toe. Banking down 0.26%, insurance down 2.49%, consumers down 0.77%, industrial goods lost more than 6% yesterday. Oil and gas that has been holding on strong is also down 0.28%. Top trades were GTCO, Transcore, and Access. Are all from the banking counter. Now let's go to the unlisted uh, NASD market also yesterday. That was on the flip side. It gained 0.48% to close at 1,156.79. The market cap has since crossed 1 trillion and uh, settled at 1.56 trillion naira. For the activity chart, it was a mixture, uh, mostly red though, uh, but volume was up. Uh, more than 800% right there. Value down 31, 13, while deals dropped by 31%. Um, five stocks have been trading for a couple of days now uh, in that market. Look at the fixed income market. That was an attraction to investors yesterday uh, for the Treasury bill. There were eight deals worth 25.05 billion naira. Of course, we know the government is using this market to mop up cash. 
One way of dealing with inflation, uh, you see, that's for the Treasury bills. For bonds, it was 13. For the federal government bonds yesterday, 13 deals worth $10.64 billion uh, right there. And, and then for OMO, this is uh, for the central bank, there were 22 deals worth $35 billion uh, market. And I will try to uh, explore or assess the trading of yesterday, the auction of yesterday, and, and uh, get the details of it uh, later on today. So you want to stay around uh, with us. Well, those are the major markets. The CSB had only four deals uh, worth 11 billion naira. So uh, is that you're in the equities or you're in the fixed, income, with fixed income, whichever way you go, you want less risk, sure income, or you want more uh, uh, revenue, but more risk also goes with everything has a price. We'll tell you more at 1 p.m. Join me for Business Incorporated. For now, it's back to the Sunrise Daily Team. Welcome back to Sunrise Daily. Well, yes, uh, as you've seen there, we've got uh, Ichako Ikwopo here with us. He is the former, wait, that was Algon. So he was chairman of Algon from 2014 up until 2021. He was also deputy president Algon National from 2016 to 2018. Good morning. Thank you for morning, coming on today. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. So lots of questions as to why the local governments are not working. I mean, we heard time and again, how if we get it right at the local government, perhaps all of this protest, all of these challenges we face, even security or lack of it, may have been addressed to a very large extent, may not have even existed in the scale that we see it today. You've been at that level for a long while, and so we assume you will have answers to some of these questions. What is the problem with the local government system? Well, I think um, the first major problem is the constitution. But I'd like to focus myself on present-day issues, and I'll deal with security, for instance. Uh, I'm happy that the former governor of um, Kano State was here, um, Senator Ibrahim Shekaro. If you listen to him, he has given a clear roadmap as to where we should be going as a nation. Um, truth is that you can't build a nation on nothing. The local governments and LCDs are component parts of the Federation. And so for you to function, and I'll give you a very clear instance. We're talking about security today. Today in every local government, you can call your community, there's a vigilante. People are paying for their own security in all our communities. Now what Hizba has done is to translate that into a government process and pay for them and ensure that they give the information we need to survive as a country. Every crime takes place in the community. And so we are saying that move that authority, most of it, to the local government chairman. And they can effectively ensure that security is paramount in the agenda for the local government. There are a lot of reasons why local governments are not working. And I'm not sure we can expose all of them today. Okay, so for those who say because the bill... Maybe it will come up for second reading. I think it will. Which of the bills now? For establishment of state police. So now, can we go ahead and have that? And if we have that, do we have a right platform to even operate that? I do not quarrel with the proponents of state police. What I'm interested in is that state police will also take the form that the current police has taken. What I'm interested in is community neighborhood policing. That is what we need as a nation. Yeah, is that we not going to be a component sorry, Chambale, we of don't need any, policing? We don't need any laws. Go and look at what Ibrahim Shekaru said, Senator Distinguished. Look at what he said. And that's been our... The current president of Algon, Kolade Alabi, held a meeting on three occasions. And we made proposals as to why we need to follow this process. 
And like I've said to you, if you go to our communities today, the kidnappers, where do they take them to? They take them to the bushes. Who knows the bushes? You can't know, your own, you can't know my bush more than your own bush. It is the local people in my area, the traditional rulers, the, tradi the, uh, the chiefs, the, 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 the um, 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 uh, religious leaders in the communities. They come together and form this, this uh, neighborhood vigilante. What they are doing now is that they are paying for their services by themselves. And so you are not really responsible to them because they are, they are protecting themselves. What is the purpose of government? To provide security for the people. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. So the point I'm making, I don't fault, first of all, it will take a long time for state police to come. I can bet you. We go through the circle of constitutional amendment all the time. I don't quarrel with that. I'm saying that side by side what they are doing, and many states have started doing this, is to ensure that we activate properly the process of empowering the council chairman across the country to take charge of community policing. Yes, but why are the council chairmen themselves too not pushing directly for it? I mean, you talked about how uh, the president of Algon has held three separate meetings, but we haven't heard them vocal enough, you know, reaching out and saying, we can do this. Um, I mean, you're talking about, uh, everybody knows about community leaders mm -hmm. of traditional rulers, um, you know, and the fact that we have vigilantes in almost every community. Sure. That has been done by self-help and through sure. self-effort. Sure. What exactly is stopping the local government Funding. chairman from being at the forefront of this? Funding. If your security vote, for instance, is one million, what do you do with that? That's the average security vote for every council chairman across the country. One million. One million, 1.5. Some 500, some 200. Yeah, so funding. But the funding somehow is appearing when the traditional rulers and, and co need to raise funds from amongst the people for this thing you're, to be done. When I say funding, yes. for instance, you are aware, or I'm telling you, that many states are not honest with their local government in the areas of funding. I have seen or heard where governors go home or make use of 200, 300, 500 million for their security votes. Where the challenge is, is the local government. You leave the chairman of council with 1.5 million. What does he do? So my point is this. I yes. mean, and maybe it's not a point. It's a question I'm trying to ask. Because <laughs> yeah, no. somehow, I mean, if the leaders, if the local government chairmen themselves were transparent and also had the trust of the people yeah. whom they led, mm -hmm. uh, the chances that when you say, look, this is the budget I have for security. This is all I have been given. Yes. We need to be able to raise money in this community for our own safety. Why do you want to keep raising money from the people for their own security? Are in the current when, when we have when when there's provision for you to have funds as a local government chairman. In many states, I'll give you a typical example. As it is today, local governments across the country have 508 billion in the Ministry of Finance. The Paris Club reforms of 2016 2018 were not returned to them. Only three states, Jigawa, Delta, and Oshu, paid these monies to their states. Now, if these funds come in and local governments get an increased allocation, which I know has gone up now because the first subsidy has added a lot of funds to the local governments, but they don't have authority. So, outside funding, the major other issue is authority. What and do you mean they don't have authority? What authority was it? Over DPO? It doesn't have authority over DPO. Oh, okay. Local government because chairman. They are, yeah, but there are two. See, as it is now, the vigilante is a self-help. We are saying convert that vigilante into a government-run security outfit and pay them. Wait, wait, wait. The former IGP, yes. at the time when several people were clamoring for state police, as it were, he did say he preferred community policing. And they put a committee in place. They did all of that program for community policing. So now you say not existing. Uh, it doesn't exist. It's not existing in collaboration wow. with the IG. It's not existing. What is existing is what, if you listen to what Malcolm said, self-help. So what we do, for instance, if I get 1.5 million as my security vote, there are 11 wards in my local government. I can say, please, because that is not, I mean, I need to, SSS is there. Even the police, you have an average of 100 policemen to cater for 400,000 people in the local government. So I can, through all the neighborhoods, I say take 20, 20,000 or 50, 50,000 to support you. Touch light, recharge card, and all of that. That's the best we can do for them. How come you say that the law, or are you saying that the law doesn't currently provide for community policing? No, which law? So at the moment now, the police 
cannot reorganize themselves and ensure a very consistent focus on the community? I, I will not well, want why to, can't that happen? I don't want to deal with the police. I want to rather deal with the issue of the community. Because if we deal with the community issue, it becomes less problematic for the police. Yeah, but who will com yeah, so, so so police the community? Is so, the police? No, no, that's the problem. Who will? That, the people, okay. the vigilante. That is the responsibility we want to place on them because they know their communities more and better. You kidnap somebody, you hear they're in the, bush, in the bushes, how do you solve the problem? The people know where the bushes are. The people know the routes to these places. Okay. But Mr. Pupu, I have a theory. And even though you have tried to say that the problem, why local government chairmen are unable to take the forefront is because they don't have the funding and the authority. True. I have a theory that it is because they did not have the trust of the people. That is because community policing essentially is, it, it deals in trust. The community, whenever it is they see anything around, they need to trust that whoever it is they're going to go and give this information to will not only not divulge who gave it to them, but will also protect them. That, that trust needs to be there. It's fading. They also need to trust that the local government chairman has their best interest at, at heart. So far, so good. In many local governments, we do not see that level of, let's say, um, that level of responsibility being shown by many, and I'm sure there are a few exceptions, being shown by many local governments. As a matter of fact, in some local governments, when you go there, they only come there once a month, and that is when their location comes, salaries are paid, everybody takes their share, and local government closes for the day. These are the kinds of things that we see. So is it really a matter of funding or how the local government itself is currently operating. So can I... Can I of course, by there all is, means. There is a myth and truth about local government administration, and I think you are falling into that trap. I was chairman of council, and I know you have access to my state a lot, Delta, and you can ask questions. The way governors also, or the presidents, travel a lot in this country, or governors spend more time in Abuja, there are also some chairmen who fall out of line in terms of service delivery. There's no doubt about that. The real issue is for those who do their job. Do you say some? Yeah, yeah I said some. Some or I said some. Um, the reason um, I say some yeah. is because I'm a player. I've been involved in local government administration. I work with them both at the state and the national level. So I know their commitment. And I'll give you an example. There was a chairman in my local government, in, uh, uh, in my state. He wasn't going to work. He didn't get his second term. He didn't get a second term. He was operating from worry. He didn't get a second term because you needed to be at work to understand what the people wanted. So when I say authority and funding, I understand what I'm talking about. Because with authority and funding, it's easy for you as chairman to see trust issues are neither here nor there. And I say that with all sense of responsibility. Because you can't sit here and talk about trust issues of someone who is in this local government ensuring that there's peace and security. Uh, but so, I, well, don't get me wrong. I, I, and I did make an exception when I, I put my question to you. I okay. did say there are few exceptions. Well, there are I, more I, in my, on my part. I do not know. Because... <laughs> how, there are few exceptions. Maybe you need to call your local government chairman. Get, no, no. Well, I tell us what happens. I live in the federal government. <laughs> There's a local government there chairman here. Area, area council chairman. But They're usually here. in the districts, in most of the districts, you know, the immediate presence of the person you feel is the federal capital, is the minister. Mm -hmm. Don't put, put it that way. The minister has an overwhelming presence here at the federal capital. Well, he does, but actually you should be the chairman of council, yes. particularly in the FCT, mm -hmm. have their roles to play. And if they play them well, if, I'm sure you, if you, even if you listen to the minister and what he has been saying, he said, go and do your job. job. It, 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 interestingly, he says that, but you also know how the FCT is structured. It has a lot of estates. So I usually know. if you have problems, maybe your first person you talk to will be your estate, you know. Exactly. So Providing, yeah, exactly I agree. Exactly service agree. within your so, estate. So you might not exactly have any... Um, relations, but I mean, we have lived in other parts of this country. Huh? As a youth core member, I'm sure if you go and talk to coppers in many parts of this country, you know, who are currently serving, what exactly has been the experience with? Because for when you are sent to a community, one of the first places you have to report to is a local government. Is a local government. True. And for years, I mean, as a copper, I remember when I served, we didn't see our local government chairman. I mean, I lived in a local government, and I, I saw just how it was. And I've also stated that fact. Run first. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm trying to say that at least in that state, yeah. 
It was the rule. It was not an exception. Well, in many places, I'm not, disag I'm not, many I'm not disagreeing people. with you. And this has been going on for years. And I'm only saying that it's not just about council chairmen. You find a lot of governors who have sentient governors. And that's the truth. It doesn't take away the fact that the council chairmen who are supposed to be closest and, to the and people... And for a, governor, for a governor who is responsible to his duties, you understand? I served on that two governors, Dr. Odwan and Senator Kowa. And they took it very seriously to stay at your duty post. Okay. So, so I'm saying that there are always exceptions. So you also... You, okay, sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 okay. okay, okay. You made reference to the fact that you know, a local government chairman who did not do what he was supposed to do in Delta, you know, was not re-elected. True. This also happened. I mean, this because there were complaints from the leaders and the community people that he wasn't coming to work. So this uh, happens in a place where even elections take mm. place. Oh yes. So in places where you have caretaker chairman, and you have that in a lot of places. How, I mean, how do we begin? Or in places where the governors are the ones who install the local government chairman. How do we, I mean, when I talk about trust, I know what I'm talking about. It's a fundamental issue. I also understand the issue of trust. Malcolm. Exactly. I've been there. I want you to talk to I've it. been there. See, and how that affects how the first, people first of relate all, to the first local of, government first of chairman. All, nobody from the moon comes to be served or serve in their communities. Nobody. So the issue of trust is, is, is neither here nor there. It's important. And so you must endear yourself to the people while serving them. And when I hear that uh, uh, local government chairmen are handpicked, governors are handpicked, other assembly members are handpicked in this country. And that's the reality we must face as a people. So that, the way that you are picked to serve does not mean that you will not serve properly. Because mm -hmm. your antecedents must speak for you at all times. Your background must speak for you at all times. And in that, on that note, you must realize that you are serving a people and you must have an agenda. That you were picked does not mean that you should not have an agenda. And most times in any event, you prepare yourself to say, I want to be council chairman. And you are not usually the only person on that plate. Because we are moving from security to general issues of local government administration. And the truth of the matter is this. Funding, like I've said, and authority. But the issue of funding for police or vigilante particularly, local governments need more funding to ensure that it's a priority for them, and by 50% in the first one month of local governments being funded properly, the issues of security will reduce tremendously in this country. Let me ask you, um, you know, if it was so easy, you said, I mean, we don't really need a new law to get into the space of uh, neighborhood police and the rest of that. A number of people will question you straight up. Asking, first of all, what happened to the Abu Biagos, the Amotekuns of this world, which are supposed to be similitude of community, uh, of community policing? What happened to, and if it was so easy, what have we been waiting for until now? Can you hear me, Mr. Um, first of all, good morning. Yeah, I can, good good morning. Hear, I can hear loud and clear. Good morning. But I, I, I listened carefully to your question, and I think that no government policy is easy. No government policy is always easily accepted. Uh, the three presidential candidates talked about the uh, first subsidy. The one that implemented it, everybody is screaming. It is how, when, and why. That is where we are. On the issue of community policing, and I say this, ask the governors that set up those security outfits. How well did they consult with the council chairman? How well did the council chairman, local communities, community heads, traditional rulers, participate? If I had a problem as council chairman and I called a meeting, the traditional rulers are the first to be there. The president generals of the communities are also there. The youth leaders of the communities are also there. They have answers to all these questions. And most times, they assist the SSS and the police who, in most cases, are short-staffed, for instance, like the police, in running the affairs of security in the local government. So the question I want to put back to you is, ask them, how well did they communicate the formation of these bodies or agencies or watches with the chairman of their local governments in their states? I know chairmen who don't have access to their governors. I know chairman who cannot call their governors. Yeah, and, and I know chairman question, who perhaps... has a, a, a commissioner. So, so for me, either it was political 
or just to, um, um, for instance, say that oh, we want to set up a security outfit for the sake of it. But that is not what we are talking about in the local government system. We are okay. saying that empower the local government by authority and funding to ensure that we get to the grassroots, get to the communities, get to the wards to ensure security is top notch wherever we go to. And our how about? Safe. How about allegations or threats or, you know, maybe fears? Yes, that's the word. How about fears of politicization of uh, apparatus of state? For instance, you know, you're talking about a state having, a local governments having neighborhood watch and the rest of them. And you have also said that the governors are holding the local, local governments one way or the other by the jugular. The fear might also be that if we gave them all the authority that they needed, they could use it against us. If, for instance, you know, the different political parties have control or authority over different local governments in a particular state, how do we deal with the politicization, or rather the fears of politicization of such community uh, or neighborhood uh, uh, security structures that you're talking about? It's always, it's, it's always there. It will never leave. And that should not be the reason why we should not begin the process. The federal police today is used against many state governors that don't cooperate with the president right from Obasanjo's time. And so it's nothing new in this country. A governor was abducted in this country by, by a civilian. And we have had cases of governors and their commissioners of police having issues. The reason they have issues is because they are not under their control and command. So the issue of fear does not arise. And you see, we are a nation that is 64 years. We need to realize that if we don't begin to understand our own democracy, we will not grow from where we are. And our democracy tells us that when we are most vulnerable is when we come to action. Today, we are vulnerable as a nation with kidnapping, with all the uh, attendance. Okay, um, we'll definitely, you know, get that back in a minute or two or in a second or two, because uh, that's actually a very, very uh, strong issue that uh, Mr. Ipoko has raised right there uh, of, uh, you know, issues that will never go away. But I also recall the governor of Kaduna State, I think, or was it, was it the governor of um, Bochi State, talking on behalf of the PDP governor, saying the state police will be with some safeguards, perhaps... If we had such a situation, what those safeguards will be will be an issue to be to be you know given due consideration. What will those safeguards be? Particularly now that, as we said at the beginning of the program, what is happening today is that a bill is going to be read on the floor of the National Assembly, one of the chambers of the National Assembly, uh, to consider the issue of state police. As some will say that's moving rather fast. So are there political considerations for that? You may want to find out what all of that is. And then there's some, oh, also the, the, the whole idea of governance and all. One of the questions that I also want to put to Mr. Ipoko very uh, strongly would be, how do we engage young people at the local government levels? Because they are the ones who are singing on the screens all over the nation where the protests, high cost of living protests, are already coming up here and there, saying that things are tough, people just want to eat, people are hungry and all. So those questions are really very important for us to ask and uh, hope we can ask them and get uh, the right answer. So Mr. Ipoko, just one last question for me and then we'll go back. How do we engage young people at the local government levels? How do we engage them in this particular issue that you are talking about in a way that they at least nerves can be calmed, particularly from the local government levels. I, I didn't get a part of your question, if you don't mind. Uh, okay. I wasn't, uh, wasn't can, can you hear me better now? Please. Can you hear me better now? Loud and clear now. Very Great. loud and clear. How do we engage young people to calm nerves in the light of all that is happening in the nation now, high cost of living, which, of course, economists say often lead to insecurity. How do we engage young people so they don't go into these nefarious activities and make and jeopardize our security apparatus even further? Well, there are different levels of engagement. Um, and I believe very strongly that outside the plans of government, depending on the government's 
um, in place in their states. But as somebody who has been engaged in local government, I believe very strongly that the local government is the easiest place and the first port of call for youths to be engaged. Don't forget that there's also urban migration. So it depends on the, 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 the quality of youth you are talking about. Now, for those who remain in the communities, I think that they can be engaged in different ways. Most of those who, who, who remain in the communities want to be meaningfully engaged. So there's farming and there's technology. And once you're able to get, and for farming, what you do is provide all the necessary um, utensils they need to work. Uh, provide seedlings, provide hectares of land for them where they don't have, and ensure that you help them to start off fish farming for those who want to engage in that. And then for those who want to be engaged in technology, build technology hubs. The local government can get engaged in um, technology hubs. I'm aware that in the, in the, rec in the recent time, in, the, in fact, in the last four months, the allocation has gone from zero to 150%. I can tell you that. So a local government that was probably earning um, um, 17 million after paying salaries is now doing 280 million. Yes, I can tell you that for free. Right. I guess um, we know that uh, we've got to do a lot more and do things differently to get improved results. So we have to thank you for coming on. Ichako Igbopo was the chairman, Algon Delta State from 2014 up until 2021. Thank you for coming on today. My pleasure being here too. So while we also clamor to get things done, look at this video. I mean, just looking at it online, it, it's, you, you, you were shot for words. Now, just have a look. It was just at this uh, local government elections in Edo State. Just listen. A fully grown man. Count, you heard that. From then he jumped to 200 and then jumped to 700 while everybody else is just there staring at him. Look, I think to put in my life, I think it's like someone who just gave him a slap somewhere. I said, Look, what's going on here with you? But we have to look inwards and help ourselves. Yeah, government has a role to play, but I heard he's a bishop. Maybe it's his first name, I don't know. But. Mm. It has to be his first name. It cannot be a title. I don't because think if it is a title, title it's maybe tricky. he was seeing spiritual beings and I counted uh, 200 of them and jumped to the next figure. It is ridiculous. Is, How will he look at his children and tell them? Embarrassing. Well, and he'll tell his court, why can't you be first in class? I was first in mathematics. When you cannot count. Look at that. <laughs> I don't know if we have time to take some meals this morning, but uh, well, look, I think we're just uh, boomy. We see your mail about the local government council and uh, Dixon. We also see your mail, but we have to anchor at this point in time. We thank you all for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm Chamberlain myself. Goodbye. I wanted to say, well, I'm still going to say, we love you. Thank you so much for watching. Bye bye. Yeah. Please do have a wonderful day and drink a lot of water, rain or no rain. Amaya Makinde, do have a wonderful day.
Following for you this hour, a veterinary technologist in charge of the zoological garden of the Obafemi Awolowo University, Ileife, Oshun State, Mr. Olabodi Olawuyi, has been killed by a lion in the campus. The management of the institution explained that the incident happened when Mr. Olawuyi was feeding the animals in their den at the garden. The university's public relations officer, Abiodun Larewaju, told Channels Television that other members of staff who were at the scene of the incident did everything within their power to rescue the deceased, but the wild cat had already caused severe fatalities on his body. Never thought that somebody could die like that in the line of duty. Mr. Bodiola, a veterinary technologist of more than two decades of experience, had been in charge of our university zoological garden for more than a decade now. And I must say loud and clear that uh, Bode has been taking care of these lions even since the time they were born. And I must say this that they were actually born into his hands. So, and he's been tendering them for the past nine years. And he wasn't there, he went there this afternoon to feed them as usual. We never knew what came over the male lion that he had to attack Mr. Lavi that way. The medical team of the university had to be there, led by the chief, uh, our own acting director of the medical and center of the university. The other members of staff tried everything they could to rescue Mr. Olawi from the grip of this white cat. But their power could not withstand the aggression of the male lion. So they had to call on the university security uh, apparatus who came with their you know, weapons. And when they too could not do anything you know, within their human powers, so they had to utilize the aggressive lion. The medical team got there, did everything they could, the first aid, another medical effort to save Mr. Lawi. But the white cat had already inflicted severe fatalities on Mr. Bodhi Olawi.